On behalf of uh, my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, I would like to invite you to the symposium under the broad title of Crossing Boundaries and Transforming Lives. This particular symposium uh, is going to focus on data sciences, and we have a, a number of very distinguished panelists who are here to participate in the symposium, and uh, in a moment you'll hear the introduction to uh, all of those colleagues who have, some have traveled from places nearby, and some have come from very far. And I will just mention one person who has come the farthest for this occasion, and that's Dr. Anzai, who is the president of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. And uh, I'm particularly thrilled that given his very busy schedule as the person responsible for the basic science research for the number three economy in the world, uh, he took the time to come here uh, for, on many counts. Um, I'm thrilled that he took the time to come here to participate in the symposium. I'm thrilled that he took the time to come here to participate in my inauguration ceremony. And I knew him when I was director of the National Science Foundation as a colleague uh, in a similar position in Japan. And even more importantly, I'm thrilled that he came here because he was Dr. Herb Simon's postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. And he spent some time here as a visiting assistant professor uh, many, many years ago. So this is coming back home for him. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, talk about big data. And uh, let me put that in uh, a context uh, using a, a couple of pieces of information. Suppose we just think about the major facilities that we have created as a country or as a community, as a scientific community uh, around the world. Some of the exciting things that have come in that use, come in in the last decade, come into existence in the last decade that use large amounts of data include things like the Human Genome Project, which consumes a large amount of data from the biology, genetics, and genomics community. Or if you take some of the large facilities in astronomy and astrophysics, which generate huge amounts of data uh, through various telescopes, either land-based telescopes or space-based telescopes, uh, that continuously gather data and look at the farthest reaches of the sky and beyond uh, with unprecedented resolution. Uh, that's enormous amounts of data. Now, if you project just in those areas, whether it's three areas, genomics and genetics on the one hand, as we go into personalized individual genome sequencing for about $1,000 a day or less, uh, in that in, in one day we can get the individual sequence and the number of people who may have this, into understanding the genomic sequence of so many different entities that we don't know yet, that's pretty remarkable. New telescopes that come into existence, for example, uh, earlier this year, in my previous job, I had the privilege of approving something called LSST, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will be built on a, around 9,000 to 10,000 feet altitude, uh, just north of Santiago in Chile. And when that comes into existence around 2018, 2019, that will provide a level of data that will be unprecedented. Yet another example of um, uh, data that will come into existence is what is often referred to as the long tail of data, which is the iPhones and the iPads and other Samsung and mobile devices that we have. Every click that we have will feed into that. Just those three alone will mean in the next 10 years we will have a volume of data that's going to be six to seven orders of magnitude more than where we are today. And just to give you an idea, an iPad that you and I have, uh, or any similar device from other manufacturers, uh, manufacturers can produce about a terabyte of data per day. Uh, and you can see how, that, how that's going to increase in the coming years. 
That's excluding another major revolution that will affect all institutions in a positive way, I hope, including Carnegie Mellon, um, and that will be involving the latest uh, in technology to not only transmit education in a scalable way in a borderless world across platforms and devices to anybody in the world, first of all, to improve the learning outcome for an individual, but also to impact millions and millions of people using such tools as artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera. And the amount of data that's going to generate is going to be enormous. So earlier this week, we announced a major initiative called the Simon Initiative, named after Dr. Herbert Simon, a pioneer in bringing computer science, machine learning, artificial intelligence to combining it with psychology with a focus on learning. And his pioneering work has influenced the very culture of Carnegie Mellon University in so many different ways, including the interdisciplinary uh, culture of this university. So it was a real privilege to name this initiative where CMU has a, a leadership role to play uh, after Dr. Herb Simon. That initiative has three components to it. One con component is more internal than external uh, to take large numbers of activities that take place on campus already involving more than 50 faculty members and bringing them together in a seamless way so that we can impact education, not only that goes going out of CMU, but coming back to CMU to our on-campus students using technology and learning outcomes in the most useful way. The second part is to form a group of very distinguished colleagues from around the world who have a major role to play in this space using technology to, to influence education and learning. Uh, so we put together a group called the Global Learning Council of uh, distinguished colleagues that represent academia, industry, um, uh, et cetera, who have a major policy ro role as well, and bring them together so that we are not just talking about what technology can do to disseminate information, but more importantly, what technology can do to improve education and learning um, especially developing uh, metrics, best practices, and eventually standards for learning outcomes. And last but not least, CMU is blessed with the fact that we've been in this business for a very, very long time. As a result, for a university, we probably have the largest data uh, system for learning outcomes. Every keystroke that a learner has used in the last 15 years is available in our database. Why not make it available to the world and invite them to join in so that they upload their data to this? We provide access to our data. So collectively, as a community, we use all of this to improve learning outcomes. That was the third goal. So when we take all of this together, one, what, is, what is the hope in this? When, we, when the US government last year announced the Big Data Initiative in Washington, if I remember the date correctly, it was the 30th of March, 2012. I was there at that event, uh, which, which took place uh, near the, uh, in Washington, D.C. It was a $200 million effort, and the National Science Foundation played a major role in participating in this. One of the biggest questions that comes up, the exciting part and the challenge is the following. If you take data in uh, uh, biology, in medicine, in education, uh, in astrophysics, uh, big data and also social data um, anonymized with respect to large numbers of people all over the world, somebody from a completely different field who may have access to that data can come up with an insight, an innovation, perhaps a product that those in the established disciplines that generate the data may not be thinking of. And that's the beauty of the interdisciplinary possibilities of this but also that generates simultaneously um, a set of challenges. If we're going to be six to nine orders of magnitude, if we're going to have six to nine orders of magnitude, more volume of data, what kind of research should we be doing today as engineers, as scientists, as social scientists, as policy makers, as humanists, uh, from areas from fine arts all the way to uh, engineering and beyond, what kind of research should we be doing today 
so that 10 years from now, we can take that mountain of data and sift out useful information from useless information, take information that's vetted and peer-reviewed versus something that's just put out there without any sanity check, and how do we take mountains of information and extract not only knowledge, but useful knowledge out of it? More importantly, how do we preserve privacy, confidentiality, and protect intellectual property in that domain? What kind of policies do we need now so that we'll be there many years from now? Equally importantly, who makes those policies? Who's responsible for it? The, the input to this is easy. Funding agencies can make the policies, but the output has no borders. So funding agencies are one institution has no authority to impose a condition on somebody else who may be living in some other continent who's not required to be bound by our policies. So the question is who is in charge? So this is why a couple of years ago at the National Science Foundation in partnership with many countries, 50 countries, including Japan and including the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science as a partner, we created something called the Global Research Council to try to address these issues. That's exactly why earlier this week, we formed this virtual council called the Global Learning Council to address similar kinds of issues for education. Of course, these two virtual entities will be in conversation with each, each other as we move forward. And those are exciting questions, and those are questions that this panel is uniquely qualified to address. And I would further add, with some bias on my part, that Carnegie Mellon is uniquely qualified not only to address these questions, but perhaps take a leadership role in all of this. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Krishnan Ramaya, the Dean of the Heinz College of Public Policy and Management, who will be the moderator for this session, and uh, uh, Krishnan will introduce the other panel members. I want to thank you all for coming, and this is a very exciting symposium. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, um, President Suresh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, as, as we think about today's topic, uh, about leveraging the data sciences, implicit in, in the title um, is the fact that we're talking about living in a very data-rich world, characterized by, as President Suresh put it, significant growth in volume, variety, velocity, and concomitant issues of governance and data quality and privacy. Um, the panel that we have assembled today, I think, is uniquely positioned uh, to provide us with their perspectives on what it means to leverage the data sciences. And what I'd like to do is um, to introduce them in turn in the order in which they're going to be presenting their remarks. I'm going to keep their introductions very brief because I could spend the rest of this panel introducing each one of them. Um, so if I might um, call on each one of them and have them take their place um, at the table, um, let me start first with uh, Dr. Anuj Danda, uh, who's CIO and Senior Vice President of Giant Eagle. Um, uh, Anuj, please join us here. Uh, Anuj, um, uh, each one of these panelists, as it turns out, has a connection uh, to CMU. Anud serves uh, on the board of visitors of the, of the School of Computer Science um, and is connected to a number of us uh, on research and other activities. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here, Anuj. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Anzai. Um, President Suresh talked about Dr. Anzai, and uh, he's uh, currently a director of the uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, former president of Keio University, and of course former postdoc and visiting faculty member at, at CMU. Uh, pleasure to have you here, Dr. Anzai. Um, our third uh, speaker is Dr. Andrew Moore. Um, Andrew Moore is, um, uh, is a VP at Google and director of Google Pittsburgh and uh, a former professor of computer science and robotics at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> our fourth is Professor Steve uh, Feinberg. Um, we've had the switch in order, as you know, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Steve Feinberg, um, who belongs to the university, literally because he's a university professor, um, 
is also a professor of statistics and social science, appointed in multiple departments and director of our Living Analytics Research Center. And um, last but not the least, uh, uh, Janet Wang, um, who's corporate VP at Microsoft, and also uh, on leave uh, from CMU, uh, President's Professor of Computer Science and um, uh, former department head of the Computer Science Department. Before we get started, just a word about logistics. Um, I know as we speak, there will be questions that many of you will have. If you could make a note of them um, and pass them down uh, to me, uh, I'll compile them. And after each one of our speakers has had their chance uh, to present their remarks, we'll take questions at the end of all the presentations by each one of our, uh, our panelists. Each of our panelists has committed strongly to me that they will stay within their seven minute limit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Kate will do the honors in, in, in keeping them uh, on track and on time. So let me uh, call on uh, Anuj to kick things off. Anuj. <clears throat> Here you go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Suresh to CMU and to Pittsburgh. But turns out he is also going to be a neighbor. So we are happy to have you and hope you'll have a great stay in Pittsburgh. Uh, in my opinion, clearly big data can be transformational. And that's why I say big can be beautiful. And that's a big statement from a small guy like me. But I do think this is a really a transformational uh, time in, the, in business and in our human lives. The first thing that I'd like to kind of talk about is when is it really transformational or when is it that important? And it is really not the data itself, but then what it does it lead to, which is really about actionable insights, whether it is in the business or as a consumer uh, of the business. So I think it is really important that we get ourselves focused in a way that we get uh, the value of the data and, and have our sights in the right place. The second thing that I think is evident to me is that when we think about uh, data and big data, what it is solving for, is really taking out in some way the friction that we have in commerce. So whether that is clearing a check which used to take days and now can be done in seconds. Or like a giant eagle today, we have to get the product from the manufacturer to the consumer and getting optimizing the whole process, I think data becomes central to that. So in each case, if you start thinking, you'll see that it is really at its core taking out the friction. And when the friction goes away, there are winners and losers in each process. So if you think about the checking account example, banks used to have float. That went away, but then we created new set of sets of services out of that uh, information around clearing of checks, that, around check images. So in each case, there are winners and losers from any disruption, and I think the opportunity for businesses is to how to make that happen. Finally, um, as we think about uh, the businesses, we really think, at least I think about, how might data impact the three major components of what we do. The first is, and what the core business we most of us have is, really creating a differentiated client experience. And whoever the client might be, but it is really to, to say, how are we using this information to connecting a more intimate uh, relationship, providing the right data, providing the right service in a very, uh, in a way that the client really needs. The second is really is operating our business, and especially around how uh, in businesses like retail, where we have to move a lots of product, lots of information to a lots of customers, uh, information becomes critical. And then third is really how we manage the firm. So if you think about banks in particular, uh, it really, it becomes how we manage risk is central is how, uh, how much data, how good the quality of data, and what insights we can lead from the data. So a couple of business challenges to kind of share with you. So as, uh, so as I was beginning to share before on Giant Eagle, so we have thousands of manufacturers. We have over 100,000 products that we sell to our clients through 400 stores. 
across five different banners, and they all have to be price optimized individually, assorted at, at, at the stores so we display them right and see what gets the right placement, and deliver to five million customers who have all different preferences, preferences requirements, uh, needs, and uh, access us through different channels. So to power this uh, optimization of this whole chain, we've been using information data in a variety of ways. We have over uh, 200 uh, terabytes of data that powers this exercise. We've been experimenting with different uh, levels of technologies that allow us to do that, and increasingly time uh, efficiency of proce processing, and then clearly the information and insight that we get that we are able to kind of share with our clients and make their buying experiences more special really creates the value. Similarly, I was uh, in banking, when we had the 2010 crisis, uh, we were having all kinds of uh, properties that we were uh, uh, foreclosing on that we, were, we had to remarket. The information, the, the banks that had the information to know the price, current prices in the market within a, uh, on a, at least on a daily basis, were far ahead uh, of those who were still updating the prices on a quarterly basis. And we had to use structured and unstructured data to really get the best information from the marketplace. And as you can imagine, what happens is, if you have the best information, so you, if your information is dated, either you're not making any uh, resales because your, your price is too high, or you're giving it away. And the income improvement was really, literally in tens of millions of dollars for institutions who got it right. Uh, Dr. Suresh mentioned in medical services, how we do the genome and how we have the electronic health record. Our colleagues at UPMC are trying to say, well, how do we bring that together in a way that we can really provide the right service and uh, for the patients that come every day. In conclusion, the part that I would say to how do we develop these successful ecosystems, at least through the eyes of a business guy. So first for us is we have to really identify that it is a strategic imperative and how we set priorities about where do we see getting the value of that, of information, and where can it open up real possibilities and solve business problems. To the technology firms, and we have a couple of colleagues on the panel here, we really need an order of magnitude change in, in the time and, and, uh, and investment it takes. We were talking about many times we will have uh, people come and tell us, well, it's a journey, and journey is three to five years. Well, five years, the like, you know, world will pass us by. We got to kind of really be able to move lots of data, analyze lots of data in a much, much faster speed and do it in a scalable fashion across enterprises. So I think that's a big challenge for us. Education institutions, again, I think the, there is a real paucity of having skilled resources. And I think this uh, approach, and I uh, was glad to see how uh, uh, Chris uh, set it up, is has to be a multidisciplinary approach. So if it gets to a, uh, a real, like as we said, data sciences, we get to a, a, a clear discipline, I think this will really benefit the businesses going forward. And finally, as, as also both of you mentioned, as data has grown, so has the risk. A risk in terms of information security and risk in terms of privacy. And I think we need to develop good ecosystems uh, in the business world, in the regulatory world, in the education world coming together to say how would we really bring uh, bring to bear clear ownership and discipline uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anuj, for uh, providing us with a business perspective on, uh, on data sciences. Uh, just a, um, a request for those of you who have your phones, they are big producers of big data, but if you could turn your phones to silent, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, if I could get Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Anzai. <clears throat> Just push it. No. Like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's my great, great pleasure to be here again after 37 years of my first arrival 
and Pittsburgh as a postdoc on this special occasion for celebrating Dr. Suresh our inauguration. And uh, it's really great, my honor. And um, uh, my brief talk is about the shaping of the big data-based society. And uh, we are in the age of the shaping the, of the big data society, as you all know, or as Dr. Suresh stressed eloquently. And data sciences are expected to overcome three things, the variety, velocity of transactions, and volume of big data, three Vs, to shape the big database society. And also the rapid advancement of computer science, digital technology, and information, and communication technology. It's calling for all the sectors to participate in this big data society we are in. But uh, we need to know that the shaping of the big data society gives us opportunities to seriously think of and implement ethics, security, privacy, and stabilization mechanisms of our society to keep human values and the world's sustainable growth. Sometimes we forget this and this rapid change of technology, but we need, th these are very important. I believe. And, oop. Yep. Uh, my talk is mainly about the examples from national policy. Uh, many sectors are involved, of course, business sectors, as I'm said, and uh, private, other private sectors, governmental sectors, educational, and others. And, uh, you know, our, this is the case from Japan. But uh, I believe that the United States and other countries are in the midst of you know, constructing, establishing, and implementing national policies as well. And uh, the cabinet, I'm, I mean, the regime was renewed in early this year in Japan, and uh, the government started to proceed the national policy for big data very rapidly and integrated our science and technology and innovation strategy, and then Japan revitalization strategy. It's called Japan is back after 20 years, lost 20 years. And the proclamation for creating the IT-based world for front nation. But anyway, it's a very small busy slide, but the totally around 150 big data policy proposals covering all the domains are now proposed or for fiscal year 2014, next year, with a total budget of approximately 1.22 billion US dollars. It's not quite a big, big amount, but uh, anyway, the government started like this, uh, including almost all the topics in uh, agriculture, or energy, or security, of course, our cyber security, and uh, uh, open data, or uh, disaster prevention, medical, or uh, any others. And uh, so uh, now uh, the government is discussing how to pick up uh, those, pro those proposals, but I bet the many of them will be adopted for the next fiscal year. The present status, one example, uh, I uh, brought uh, uh, the life science databases. And now we have, the government supports around 900 databases, uh, they are cataloged, just cataloged. And around 300 are cross searchable databases and 51 archived. And uh, uh, almost 90,000 users per month and uh, uh, 2 million 300,000 page, page views per month. And, uh, I found that almost the same or uh, similar uh, amount of budget as our input uh, to keeping and maintaining and uh, you know, enlarging databases for life sciences in Japan, the United States, and EU are almost the same. And they are so going in parallel in the world. And new proposals are example projects for brain science and technology. And Japan uh, start, would start uh, the topic for a newer secretary of marmosets. It's a small monkey with uh, 10 inch meters high 
by innovative technology, about around 100 million US dollars just proposed for next year. And for USA, you know, brain initiative or, or announced by uh, President Obama and New York Secretary of Modern Animals by Innovation, Innovative Technology. They're very similar with Japan and just 100 million US dollars proposed for next year. And for EU, uh, they call that human brain project. They, uh, that is very different, uh, rather different. Uh, they integrate brain science, and, but with information compu uh, communication technology and medical care was approved already in January this year and totally 1,500 million US dollars for 10 years. So the, the amount of budget, was, they are almost the same, you know, roughly the same. So Japan, US, and EU are thrusting into brain sciences and life sciences like this you know, from the big data points of view. So this is our last slide. Examples from private sectors in Japan, uh, from enterprises first. Komatsu, you know, it's a uh, company for you know, big trucks or you know, uh, construction machinery and others. They have uh, around uh, 200,000 uh, large-scale trucks are working in, the, for example, the mines in South America or in Africa and the uh, remote places. And uh, Komatsu installed many, many sensors uh, in, their, uh, uh, in those trucks or machineries, and they gather data every day from all over the world. And they use that for uh, uh, you know, safety, uh, you know, uh, uh, protection and also for inventory control. And Komatsu is well known, has been well known for this. So our private industries or private companies have started that earlier than the national policy actually. So I said in the first slide that uh, uh, technology very fast or, and the business fast or science modest, but the policy is fairly slow. Well, it started. Uh, right now. Hitachi, uh, it's a big company, and uh, one example is that they are constructing, you know, uh, designing and uh, uh, distributing uh, gas turbines or for uh, coal uh, fire uh, power plants. And uh, they, uh, for each uh, gas turbine, they install around 200 uh, sensors, and uh, they gather uh, as are uh, similar to Komatsu, they gather data uh, 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 in real time, I should say. And they use that for, uh, uh, for maintenance and inventory control or any other things. And those are examples of uh, using big data uh, from, our, from years ago. They, they have been doing that years ago. SoftBank, uh, they're using the, our uh, page view data or around uh, 50, 50 billion page views per month or, or to or, or analyze or behavior, or user behavior and recommendation and the other things. And it's well known uh, uh, too, as well as many others. And from individual uh, innovators, i just show you. It was a uh, great earthquake happened uh, March 11 uh, in 2000. 2011. Yep. This is the uh, big data gathered from a movable GPS. I mean, the uh, cell phones and others. Uh, and that is the, the time. Now we're six o'clock in the morning on uh, March 11, uh, 2011. And eight o'clock in the morning, the, they are, uh, that the uh, map of uh, Tokyo metropolitan area. And the people, uh, the cars and trains are going around in the morning. Now we're 11 o'clock and at noon, uh, the earthquake occurs at 2.45, you can, now are 1.30, 2 o'clock, you can see it now, okay. 
you know, that traffic just stopped. I was sent there, actually, in the center of Tokyo, and everything stopped. And now, uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the evening, and still, they, they could not use a car and walked, and because the train stopped and car congested and uh, everything was in a mess. But, 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 this is midnight. Some cars are now uh, going out to suburbs from Tokyo, uh, central area. Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock, now three o'clock in the morning next day, and four, five o'clock. They are now getting up to start to work, six o'clock. Now trains start to work, you know. So uh, Tokyo recovered in just one day, and uh, that's all. But the, oop. It doesn't, well, how can I do with this? <laughs> I'm a bit running out of time. Uh, okay. And um, uh, yeah, that's all. Anyway, and uh, we can use that sort of big data for uh, you know this uh, disaster analysis, or you know to prevent uh, another disaster in future, and many other things. But uh, uh, it's, uh, still, it's very difficult. You to we can analyze the data, but how to use those data to another opportunity is uh, still we need to see, and. Uh, the third one, uh, great uh, from sharing of uh, big data sets here, it's uh, usually big, big data are unstructured. I mean, there are different structures. Uh, each big data has different structure. And so uh, uh, data from our big earthquake, uh, great earthquake had very different structures for traffic and for trains or uh, a tsunami or radioactivity, they're all have very different structures of data. And we need to integrate that to find something uh, toward the, the future. And uh, still, uh, and then we need some models, or we need some theory, or we need to have some methodology for analysis, for policy making, and now we are in discussion for doing things like that. It's more, actually more important than, you know, just, uh, you know, putting data uh, and uh, seeing that uh, we need some models or theories to analyze to find out good data. And uh, the, uh, the last one is an example from scientific research projects going on in Japan, and uh, I don't explain anymore, but the, there are many uh, you know, scientific uh, research projects going on for big data analysis, theory, algorithms, and architecture, computer architecture, database machines, or in our scalable database uh, engines and others, or uh, you can see something like that. So uh, scientific research, um, uh, governmental uh, projects, uh, I mean, for uh, uh, gathering and maintaining big data, and of course, for medical or life sciences too, and private sectors are go uh, have been doing are earlier, and they have been making much, much effort uh, for themselves. And so now they are being integrated together, and this may be the uh, first year for, the big, for shaping the big data society for Japan. And uh, I believe that it's happening here, what has happened here in uh, the US and in the EU too. And I ho really hope that Carnegie Mellon would lead this uh, you know, shaping of the society based on big data led by uh, you know, the new president, Dr. Suresh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anzai, for your perspective on, uh, on data sciences and policy uh, and for raising these research challenges. Uh, let me ask uh, Andrew Moore uh, to come on up here. Andrew? <coughs> All right, uh, well, I, 
As, as everyone else has mentioned, we're absolutely delighted and excited for the uh, new age at uh, Carnegie Mellon with our new president. And uh, uh, as a local member who's only traveled 2.1 miles to get here instead of uh, 17,000 miles, uh, uh, a huge welcome to our new president. Uh, here's an interesting statistic. Every year, on average, 500 people are killed by massive asteroids hitting the Earth. The important thing to understand about the statistic, it's an average. In fact, what it is, is uh, every 100,000 years, about 50 million people are killed by this uh, event. <laughs> so that, the fact that that's an average is either good or bad, depending on whether you're risk-seeking or risk-avoiding. Uh, so uh, this is a photograph of the PanSTARRS telescope, uh, which is actually the predecessor to the LSST, which uh, Dr. Suresh uh, uh, mentioned earlier on. And one of the many things it did uh, uh, still doing is taking plates of the sky, pictures of the sky every night, uh, in different places each night, uh, many, many, many of them. And when you look at the actual data on the plates and you go right down into sort of when you're counting individual photons on each pixel, uh, it, you look at the plates and it looks like a, a TV set that's untuned. It's just a, a bunch of sort of white noise. What you can do with these plates, though, over time is you can still even though there's a lot of noise in them, you can still try to ask the question, what if there were a asteroid hurtling through the uh, outer or inner solar system? Uh, what kind of effect might it have done to the overall distribution of the noise uh, of those plates? So it's a big spatial problem to figure out, based on all of these plates, if there's evidence for big things uh, moving around uh, in the solar system. These asteroids. Uh, the right size, they tend to spin, and so they reflect light at different times uh, uh, towards the Earth in different ways. And so it's, uh, you may sometimes get missing data, or you may sometimes get visible data for them. If you want to figure out from these whether they're, you know, where there are as yet undiscovered asteroids, you can do the following. You can take every single apparent blob on every single plate, and you can look at all quintuples or hextuples of blobs. So every every set of six blobs seen over different nights in different parts of the sky, you can try to fit an orbit to that and see if it looks like it's a realistic uh, uh, asteroid. Problem with doing that is there's a lot of data. So of course, uh, much as uh, our previous speakers have described, you get trillions of uh, data points uh, coming through every month from, from these systems. But what makes it much worse is when it's harder than writing computer programs to scan through those trillions of things looking for something, but instead you have to look at lots of combinations of those things. For those of you from the computer science background, this was an n to the fifth problem where n is in the trillions to try to find these tracks. The interesting thing about it, and why I give this as my favorite example of a big data or a data science problem, is how there really are some nice statistical models for how we expect the noise, these noisy images to look as a function of the asteroids. And there's a really fun computational puzzle as to how you can do the equivalent of looking at all trillion to the power of five possible tracks. And the guys who worked, worked on this, including a bunch of folks from Carnegie Mellon, uh, came up with a nice algorithm to do this. Among this algorithm's accomplishments were a couple of years ago, it discovered uh, one, of the first, uh, one of the first 30 or 40 dwarf planets in the solar system, and it was one of the first discoveries by a computer program instead of a, a person. That is the uh, boringly named TG422 uh, mini planet inside Neptune's orbit. Uh, this thing is now having to scale up much further in anticipation of the LSST telescope and other ones where we're going to be uh, as Dr. Suresh mentioned, dealing with at least 10 to the 5 times as much data. So that's interesting and fun. Big data, big science. One funny story is that uh, the person who uh, authored some of the algorithms for this, the ne their next job uh, at Google right now uh, is related to another form of uh, absolutely massive data. So uh, this is a picture of one of our data centers. Uh, this is actually just part of one of our data centers, and uh, as you know, the size of data centers, and the number of data centers around the world has been growing quite considerably. One of the things we use our data centers for is a very important problem, which is given a query to a search engine, 
figure out what are the most useful results, what are the most useful things to, uh, to show. And in particular, uh, you can turn that into a pretty well-founded statistical problem of out of all the possible links I could show, given that the user has typed in this query, uh, which ones have the highest probability of being clicked? So to solve that problem, we're looking at the same kind of order of magnitude of data, and we need this, uh, this scale of infrastructure to be able to cope with all the data coming in at the rate it's coming in and the ground truth data in order to build the models to do those predictions. But once again, it's not enough just to have machines which are capable of storing and indexing this amount of data. You actually have to do some N squared type things while you're dealing with it uh, in order to, to run the uh, inference algorithms uh, for predicting uh, what is the most useful thing to show to the user. So once again, there's a really nice statistical model you can write down, and there's fundamental algorithmic questions, which means that it's not enough to just buy more computers or have faster CPUs. You've actually got to be passionate about the algorithms underneath it. Uh, the folks who have built this system, uh, in, in, they're, they're now in Google Pittsburgh in Bakery Square, a lot of these folks did not come from the world of statistics or machine learning or anything like that. They, uh, many of them actually came from four systems. Uh, uh, Alfred Spector, one of the uh, CMU alumni, uh, who I think is uh, showing up tomorrow for this celebration, uh, was one of the founders of that. These folks who spent most of their careers working with the kernel and final systems are now experts in linear algebra as well in order to have it so that we can do the, the computations needed for click-through prediction combined with uh, uh, dealing with this massive amount of data and the data rates. So it's very interesting how these things uh, fit together. I'm just going to mention a couple more uh, cases here. Uh, Dr. Dando mentioned uh, with, with Giant Eagle this very important problem, which uh, most of the world of commerce is wrestling with at the moment, that there are so many things for sale, they change so quickly, and uh, all of the e-commerce companies need to understand them, that it's getting beyond reasonable to have humans annotating uh, every product and every combination and every variety that's coming, coming through. So you see many parts uh, of industry and science trying to replace human annotators for uh, the kind of objects that, that are uh, for sale. And the kind of computer algorithms which were actually pioneered here in CMU for computer vision, uh, especially the ones in the late 90s and early 2000s, the main interesting question that we've had to answer now is how do you run these things on 50 million new items a day instead of uh, uh, sort of churn them over out on a, on a couple of dozen uh, items a day? So that's a pretty interesting one. Uh, here's another nice place where uh, data science has become really important. What you see here is what happens to your browser if you keep saying yes while you're playing with the internet. <laughs> you get all kinds of interesting things happening on your computer. Uh, all kinds of uh, new toolbars, all kinds of new interesting uh, pieces of software which are running in the background and giving you all sorts of alerts. So <coughs> uh, many Many search engine companies and other companies are trying to keep things safe and sane, and it's a very interesting problem how to deal with that. Again, if you look back 10 or 20 years, the way you kind of enforce policies and make sure that uh, folks are behaving reasonably in software distribution is you have people doing it, uh, and investigations when something seems to be a, a little bit crazy. These days, you cannot afford to do this. The rate at which these types of new things are being invented uh, would uh, dwarf a building of containing hundreds or maybe even thousands of security investigators. We have to have automated ways to detect and classify what is potentially dangerous uh, for computer users to use. Final thing I wanted to mention, uh, which is another kind of area which you don't necessarily think of with internet companies and the internet, but is absolutely happening at the moment, is delivery and actually reducing people's impact on the environment. This is an image of part of our fleet of a very large robot that Google has built in the San Francisco Bay Area. This robot is actually about 600 Prius cars driven by people. These are actually driven by people. And what they're running is a same-day delivery network where uh, if you're lucky enough to live in the Bay Area, but we hope future uh, this will come to Pittsburgh, uh, 
that when you want to buy something, you can get it with a two-hour delivery window. And making that happen is another of these really interesting n-squared computational problems. The interesting problem underlying this one is if you've got tens of thousands of people every hour clicking on wanting to get things from certain local stores every hour, you have to solve uh, the problem of how to route six or 700 vehicles to do as many pickups and drop-offs as efficiently as possible to, uh, to get things to people when they need them. A nice statistic here is that about a quarter of all the traffic uh, in the areas we're looking at is from people going out manually to shop for stuff them driving their own car out to somewhere in the godforsaken suburbs of San Francisco to, to pick stuff up uh, and then come home. Uh, we have a, as this stuff gets adopted, we have a great reduction in the footprint of people having to drive around because moving stuff to people instead of people going out to grab stuff from local retail stores is so much more efficient. So I just wanted to do one final comment, which is the, the main thing I've been trying to get across here is that for me, Data science is very exciting, but for the folks in the audience who are uh, like starting out in their careers or, or studying at the university, I want to be clear that it's very hard. It is not meant to be fun. It's very interesting, but it's not meant to be fun. So when I used to teach AI classes here, I was a real curmudgeon. And uh, at the start of each of the uh, AI courses, I would sort of wave my finger at the students saying, ah, you young weapon snappers, you want to learn AI? If you want to learn AI, this is what you have to study, numerical analysis in C language in order to uh, get this stuff done real. It's primarily about the need for uh, the high quality, fast numerical algorithms to solve the search problems that are needed. Now, in the world of uh, data sciences, my answer is, if you want to be in data science, if you want to design a curriculum for data science, you've got to learn all of computer science and all of statistics. So it's <laughs> twice as hard, but it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, very visual demonstration. Um, we, we have Steve Feinberg next. Steve. <clears throat> I'm especially pleased to be here as the faculty representative sandwiched between two former colleagues, both of whom I hope will come back to CMU because we miss them dearly. But for those of you who don't know, Andrew and I not only were colleagues, but we've shared a house. <laughs> At any rate, I came in from London last night, so I guess I get in second place. <laughs> um, the brochure that you were given as you came in talks about data science and many elements, design and collection of data, instrumentation, privacy, analysis. And if you look at that definition, which I've captured in a bullet, To me, as a statistician, it looks like statistics. But data science at Carnegie Mellon is really much more. It's broader than statistics, as the talks so far have tried to make clear. And especially important is that infrastructure and instrumentation at the front end in the databases which make data science a reality. And today, I have a simple, single example at CMU, how we cross these many boundaries. The, the example I will show you when it comes back up is from the Living Analytics Research Center, which is based in the Heinz College but incorporates faculty from across the university. And is based on our partnership with Singapore Management University. And that was SMU that you just saw. 
The infrastructure here comes from computer science. The analyses will involve social and business analytics, information systems, networks, statistics, machine learning, and privacy protection. You're watching people using their cell phones and communicating on a network which, as President Surich described, is actually recording every transaction, every communication. And I want you to look at the people in this video and watch them interacting. It's the interactions that we're interested in because we would like to send messages, recommendations to these people, and we need to know the groups in which they're interacting. So here we see people interacting as a pair. Not too hard when you see the video, but not necessarily easy when you simply see the info from their cell phone. And now we get a group of size four. And they're interacting through, again, a different set of communication. These are students from Singapore Management University and they're working in different settings and interacting in different settings, in groups of different sizes, in classrooms, and their data can be captured, analyzed, and used in new experiments to understand interactions and the way in which we can share information and give recommendations that people really want to utilize. So this isn't just a concept. At the beginning of September, over 700 students at Singapore Management University signed up to participate in Live Labs. We're essentially running a small telecommunications company, and it constantly monitors all the participants. We measure them every two seconds to within three meters, and we measure their activities. We communicate with them, they with one another, and they with us. And this will gradually expand to the entire campus, to all the students, the faculty and the student, uh, and staff. And uh, CMU has played this essential role in the instrumentation. It's IRB approved, students have consented to participate, and the data are flowing into the Living Analytics Research Center. So what are we going to do with the data? There are many challenges. And the thing I wanted you to get from that video was that people simply don't interact in pairs. The couple interacted in pairs, but then you saw groups in a classroom, groups of four, groups of other sizes. And those of us who analyze network data are accustomed to thinking about dyads, interactions of two people in a pair, but now we have to think in groups of larger sizes. And so instead of graphs, we need to think about hypergraphs. Network data that's very rich, but where the structure is latent, we don't actually observe the links necessarily, but we want to detect them in real time. And we need to develop the statistical tools that actually allow us to look at trajectories in time and space and their interactions. And then when we have that, we can experiment by sending messages to subsets of people and following the, them over time and compare treatments with one another. And then finally, we need to think about how to share this data. Share this data with one another here at Carnegie Mellon, 
and how to protect it in a way that it can be shared more broadly in the way that President Suresh suggested in his opening remarks. These challenges clearly transcend our research activities. In the audience today are people working on individual elements, but they will go far beyond CMU. And the example is typical of the many other research collaborations that illustrate the excitement at CMU surrounding data science. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Jeanette? Good afternoon. I'm Jeanette Wing, and I am thrilled to be here. I want to congratulate Pre President Suresh on this inaugural celebration. Um, I feel really like being back home, being on campus. So um, I'm going to actually tell you about a few little stories uh, in, in the few minutes that we have remaining. Um, the stories actually um, are from government and industry because I'm leaving to Steve Feinberg, the covering academia. Um, I wanted to start with uh, my government story because uh, I got, uh, President Suresh got to the National Science Foundation just as I was leaving. And um, I like to think that the program that we put into place in 2007 actually laid the foundations for the big data initiative that came out by President Obama uh, last year. And the program, which we called Cyber Enabled Discovery and Innovation, started out uh, on about $50 million. By the time I left, we had a $100 million dollar budget request, of course, FY11 was a, a whole other story. But we're, there were three themes in this program, CDI, and the first thing was from data to knowledge. So way back then, and that's actually not so way back then, we recognized the importance of data. And we recognized that it wasn't about data, it was about extracting the knowledge from the data. And so even back then we were encouraging so the science and engineering communities uh, outside of computer science to be using techniques from computing like machine learning, the uh, data infrastructure and so on that you heard about already to discover new knowledge in their own science and engineering. Well, I wanted to say that it's not just from data to knowledge. Now I like to talk about from data to knowledge to decision. It's much like um, Anuj was saying, you know, it's, it's not enough to have this data. You actually want to make some financial decisions or you want to do some optimization, some planning. Um, you actually, a human being actually wants to take this knowledge and decide on some policy. In other words, make a decision. And the story I'm going to tell you now is, is one I like because it starts very pure. It starts from astronomy, just like for, uh, President Suresh and Andrew Moore were talking about telescopes. Well, I have a telescope story too, um, but it's going to end. It's going to end with a somewhat small example of how you can use this data. In fact, the technology behind using this data to make decisions. So my story is from astronomy to city planning, and yes, there'll be a little Microsoft thing in said inside, but you, okay. So many, um, many years ago, of, or I, I should say over the years, there have been many, many telescopes, not just the LST, which is being built. And these telescopes on Earth and in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, has been taking enormous amounts of images um, and collecting enormous amounts of data. And brilliant idea. Why don't we build a virtual telescope that will allow us to visualize all these different images from all these different telescopes? And then why don't we actually allow ourselves to tour the universe through this virtual telescope? And that is what the worldwide telescope is. So I am 
going to just play a little snippet of how you can you know, go travel through the universe based on all these images collected from all these telescopes. And here we're going through some galaxy, and we're going to zoom in on the Milky Way, coming up soon. Uh, and when you, as we approach um, the, our own Milky Way, you'll see that it's coming. <laughs> our, um, uh, uh, we are actually in the spiral part of the Milky Way. Um, and uh, now we're going to zoom in onto Saturn. And eventually, we're going to hit uh, planet Earth. So I, I'll, I'll just stop this for the, well, Earth is coming up soon, so we'll get there. <laughs> and then I'll stop. And this is just based on all this data that was collected um, through these scientific instruments. Um, and the point really is uh, when you have a lot of data and in the end you want, want to make a decision about it, well, you don't want to look at the bits. And in fact, you don't want to look at all those photons. Uh, and you don't even want to look at each of the images one by one. You actually want to provide a way to visualize all this data. And so the point about the Worldwide Telescope was to visualize all this astronomical data. Astronomical, astronomical data. <laughs> so now, so, so this is the, the Microsoft part of it. Uh, so, so people at Microsoft built the Worldwide Telescope and they said, hey, why don't we point from the sky to the Earth and allow people to visualize all this data that we have collected about things going on in cities or things going on in regions and countries. And so now, believe it or not, in Excel 2013, there is a feature called PowerMap, and it allows you to take any Excel spreadsheet and visualize the data. And so I'm just going to show a very simple example to illustrate um, how you can visualize the data and take a tour, just like we took a tour through the universe, take a tour through Chicago uh, narcotics. Uh, and and the, the point really is, imagine you're the mayor of Chicago and you want to know, you know, where are all the people smoking pot, where are all the people taking heroin, you know, go send the police here and there, and so on. So this is just one example. And uh, we'll see that uh, the green bars actually represent, I think it's less than three grams of cannabis. Um, and I think the, the red is either heroin or cocaine, I can't remember. The blue is the other one. And you can see that as we're zooming in, you can see there's a spire. Uh, what's, you ask, well, what's that? That's actually at the police station where they do all the arrests. Uh, and, and then you actually, well, I'll just let this play to the very end. There's a, 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 a couple of tourist sites on, on the lake, and you'll see that there's high uh, arrests of uh, people smoking pot there. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just go on. But, but if I let this play, you'll see that. OK, I'll, I'll let it play. There we go. Uh, there's the uh, Adler Planetarium and the Navy Pier. OK. All right. Um, so that's actually an example. The reason I like that example is it starts out so pure. It's about understanding the universe and visualizing the universe. And then it gets into Excel somehow. Uh, <laughs> it's like, wow, amazing. Um, and that's kind of a Microsoft story. It started out in Microsoft Research. But there's actually some wonderful data science going on in Microsoft Research. Um, believe it or not, you wouldn't think this because you think Microsoft Research is all about computer science, but in fact, it's very interdisciplinary. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in the medical, plant, environmental, and ecological sciences. In particular, there's a very strong group um, that looks at genomics of viruses, and they've been doing, using machine learning, um, doing a lot of very interesting discoveries about the HIV virus and actually more recently about the plain old flu virus. Um, there's also a very large group in Microsoft Research Cambridge, Cambridge UK, that has been focusing on, so, so the genomics is like in the small, but lots of data about it. 
and, and, and the Cambridge group is on environmental and ecological sciences, they've been looking at, uh, for instance, taking lots of different data from um, uh, weather observatories, um, from agricultural uh, agencies, putting all these data about the earth, about the sky, and um, creating climate models so that you can actually do some prediction from these data and it's using standard machine learning kinds of techniques to do the analysis and prediction. Um, I wanted to close with what I think is a major breakthrough, certainly in computer science, but I think per potentially that will transform society once we really get the technology um, there. And it's the, and there are many reasons I want to tell this particular story. Um, it's the speech to speech demo that Rick Rashid gave in Tianjin, China about a year ago. He spoke English, and in real time, there was a translation of his English into Chinese. This is a Chinese audience. And the Chinese came out sounding like his voice. So, I'm going to play this. And Rick Rashid, by the way, was a professor here at Carnegie Mellon, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to tell this story. OK. There's much work to be done in this area. Those are about 3,000 students in the audience, all Chinese students. But this technology is very promising. And we hope in a few years that we'll be able to break down the language barriers between people. Personally, I believe this is going to lead to a better world. OK, well, I can see that there are not that many Chinese speakers in the audience, but there are a couple of here. I'll tell you, I don't speak Chinese, but whenever I listen to this, I get the tingles. Uh, I got all tingly. And, and the reason I was actually at that demo when he was giving it and you just, you could feel the emotion in the audience when the translation was Chinese and it was very accurate. Now, in fact, the hard part of that demo was the speech recognition part uh, and, and not so much, you know, translating it so it sounded like, you know, once, once you recognize the speech, you have a textual description, then you throw it into your uh, machine translator. Um, and then speech modulation, no, no big deal. I'm, I'm really exaggerating here. But it was a speech recognition. And what was it? What was it that got the speech recognition so, so, um, so improved from previous, uh, a lot of work, in fact, a lot of work done here at Carnegie Mellon in speech recognition. What was it was a kind of machine learning technique called deep learning. And it was using these deep neural networks that allowed um, us to have that um, high speech recognition rate. And um, again, another Carnegie Mellon tie here. People like Dave Turetsky and Jeff Hinton, before he went to Toronto, were at here, uh, Jeff was here at Carnegie Mellon working on neural networks and in, in the 80s. And neural networks in, in the 80s were, were like toy, if you look at it from today's point of view. What made neural networks practical in the sense of being able to do this kind of demo was big data, lots and lots of data. And so I think this, this really is a demo that goes to show the potential of what we could do with big data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, Thank you to all the panelists. I know we are, we are a little over our, our time. Um, what's that? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. We are a little over our time, but I think I'll try and squeeze in one, uh, one question for the panelists. 
Uh, Jeanette ended with, um, you know, those three nodes, science, technology, and society. And I think all our panelists have covered various aspects of sciences, technology, uh, the ways in which value could be extracted from data for the benefit of policy or, or business, and highlighted some of the major research challenges that still remain. If I were to sort of take a look at some of these various questions that have been posed here, one of the things that uh, keeps coming up is this question of, one, how do you support interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research in the data sciences? And how do you curate data to support interdisciplinary research in the data sciences? I wondered if one of you wants to take a, a shot at answering that question. I remember we struggled with the, is, is this on? We struggled with this question at the National Science Foundation, which is, of course, representing <coughs> multiple science and engineering disciplines. And I remember we were arguing about a particular um, large instrument from physics that uh, the physicists wanted to collect certain amounts of data and throw away other amounts of data. And I said, no, we shouldn't throw away any data because you never know if someone else in some other discipline will find something interesting in that data you want to throw away. Uh, but this, you can't keep everything, so you actually do have to make decisions. Uh, another example was we had lots of, um, there are lots of scientific instruments in the South Pole, in, in the Antarctic, and it's very, very difficult to actually transmit that data um, you know, uh, to say the warm, fuzzy uh, lab in the United States because the satellite uh, uh, transmission is, is uh, weak and the, it only it goes around the globe and you can only hit it twice, uh, you know, a day or whatever it was. And so, again, the, the point was, well, we'll just throw away some of that data. We don't have to keep all the data. And we just felt really uncomfortable with that. But in fact, reality is you can't keep all the data. So I think it's actually a, a struggle. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, I, I just wanted to address the interdisciplinarity question. I, this comes up in almost every forum in which I participate. And people say, it's so difficult. And then I say, look at CMU. We just do it. <laughs> the Living Analytics Research Center has visiting students here, seven from Singapore Management University this year, parked in four different colleges. The project I showed you has faculty involved from two other colleges plus those four. And there's seamless interaction across the boundaries. If you want to interact with somebody else at CMU, <laughs> you send an email message, you show up at the door, or you just talk to them and everyone is welcoming. So on that very positive note, <laughs> so I, I want to uh, thank all the panelists for uh, being on this panel. I want to thank um, my colleague uh, Rob Cass, uh, who was very helpful in pulling this panel together. And um, there's a number of data science programs educational programs, master's programs that now have been developed across CMU by different colleges at CMU from computer science, from Dietrich Statistics, from Tepper, uh, from Heinz. Uh, there's a, a website that's been created to help people navigate this. I urge you to take a look at that. And in addition to those educational programs like Steve mentioned, there are a number of cross-cutting initiatives around campus on research. Do get to learn more about this. This is an exciting time. Uh, both for being around and being, taking part in this major data science activity. Thank you all for coming, and do stick around for the next panel to come, uh, which is going to be very exciting as well. Thank you again. Thank you.